I'm going to tell you today about particle accelerators, and which are, have been the primary tool to do particle physics for 50 years or 60 years. Uh, in the spirit of full disclosure, I'm not an accelerator physicist. I'm a person who works with Ray Weiss, who people hear next on LIGO, and I've spent most of my career doing particle physics as an experimentalist. But I know a lot about accelerators. I helped design this one, or I led the design of this one. And uh, when I started in physics as an undergraduate, uh, the first thing I ever did was work in Berkeley on the 184-inch cyclotron as a student and uh, have always hung around accelerators my whole life. So uh, I'm going to tell you about why accelerators are important to particle physics. I'm going to use as the case example the one that we've designed, which is the, the dream of particle physicists to be the next accelerator. And it's proposed to the Japanese government right now, who are doing due diligence on it. And uh, a little bit about the future, because there's a question about whatever happens what's going to happen in 20 or 50 years to particle accelerators, which get bigger and more expensive in each generation. So I'll try to talk a little bit about each of those, uh, but mostly about uh, accelerators, so about a uh, linear collider. So let me introduce the subject a little bit, starting from particle physics to drive the discussion. And this picture is one of many you could use to say, what is particle physics? Uh, there's a, a whole kind of potpourri of questions and areas that we study, varying from uh, looking at very, very rare things, decays of K mesons or other particles, uh, studying neutrinos, which have been very popular and, and uh, productive in recent years, to working directly on particle accelerators and studying the Higgs, which came out of uh, the Large Hadron Collider, or a bunch of other things, some of them done underground and so forth, and they come back to something that isn't just a single purpose. Um, a bunch of, let's say, theoretical ideas that might be where the overall picture of particle physics, which we don't have yet, can come together, whether it's uh, the unification of the forces, or whether it's some connection to co cosmic things, or uh, ideas that there are more than three dimensions in the dis discussion of particle physics. So this is, just examples, and people can make different kinds of pictures. Uh, a list of questions I'll give you here, which is not mine, but comes from a, a little handout on particle physics called the quantum universe, uh, which gives you just some picture of the breadth of questions that are asked, all of which cannot be answered by particle accelerators, uh, some of them by uh, satellite experiments, some of them deep underground. But the majority of them, the biggest tool and most effective tool we've had for 50 or 60 years is particle accelerators. So an example of the kind of questions are uh, whether there are some fundamental principles that we don't understand yet. New symmetries in nature, the picture that I'll come back to later is something called supersymmetry. Uh, whether there's a particle physics uh, answer to the question of dark energy or dark matter uh, whether there are extra dimensions, something I talked about before. Um, what are neutrinos all about and what are they telling us? We have the fact that neutrinos have different masses. Uh, why do we have the different families and so forth and so on? So that's more or less uh, this big scope of questions that we ask. And we have different tools to answer them. And I'm just going to talk just about one of them today. So the main ones that have been so productive in recent times are neutrinos, which basically are useful both in understanding the neutrino, which we have to understand, and in the fact that the neutrino doesn't interact very much. So when it interacts, we can understand the interactions very well. And so it's been a very, very useful probe of both physics beyond the neutrino and the neutrino itself. We're understanding more recently that neutrinos have mass has been an important advance in particle physics. The second, which has been uh, important in recent years, is what connections there are between particle physics and astronomy and astrophysics. The most logical one is dark matter. It may have a particle physics connection, which means you have kind of a double win when you find out what it is, uh, the leading candidate being, for example, supersymmetry. 
or maybe the dark matter is not connected to particle physics, but at least the particle physics connection is here, and it's looked for on, the, on large accelerators, and it's looked for uh, underground and in other ways. And then we have accelerators, which is what I'm going to concentrate on. And we know and have heard a lot about the Large Hadron Collider, which uh, basically scatters protons off protons. Uh, and uh, the thing that people know best is the discovery of the Higgs boson, which I'll address in terms of what a new accelerator might tell us about the Higgs boson. And lastly, and that's where I'm going to concentrate, is electron-positron colliders. And in particular, in my case, I'm going to talk about a linear collider, which is a new kind of tool and technology that we're driven to if we go to high, very high energies. So let's start with accelerators and what the general principle of a particle accelerator is. They work in different ways, but this is a generic example that you have an electromagnetic wave that you create that's passing in, down in space or Classical machines just did it in one, time, one place around a machine, but typically you have a machine that has an electromagnetic wave. And in the little picture are the particles that basically might be trailing or might be leading the, the, uh, the group of particles. And you want them to be in a bunch because that's the way we can best experimentally study them is put them in bunches where things happen and we look at that bunch of particles. And that happens naturally in this picture because the ones that are here have the highest field and they catch up and the ones that are here go slowest because they're not uh, pushed as hard. And so you get a picture a little bit like this thing on the right where they tend to bunch up. So you can naturally bunch the particles, which you want to do if you create a traveling wave that looks like this. So that's just a principle. The second thing which I want to emphasize is that we learned in the 1970s, or maybe we learned this principle earlier, but we were able to make the change. Particle accelerators until the 1970s worked like the top picture. You made a, some sort of an accelerator, a cyclotron or a synchrotron or a higher energy machine or a LINAC, and took those particles and ran them against a target. If you wanted to make the target simple so you could understand the physics, this was typically a proton target, meaning hydrogen, and uh, studied the scattered particles. If I take as an example a beam that's high energy, like we talk about today, say 450 GeV, and scatter it off a, a target at rest, the total energy that we get in the center of mass, which is the physics that we talk, we're talking about, is how much energy we go to or how short a distance, is calculated by this formula here, and that gives 29 GeV. If instead I can have the 450 GV beam scatter off another 450 GV beam, what we call a colliding machine, then you get far more energy, 900 GV. And here's the formula. So that's just kinematics, but it's crucial, and that's where we made the switch. So the big switch in particle physics was not just the advance of better and better accelerators, but the change to accelerators that we call colliders. And that happened in the 1970s. The first big one was built at SLAC, and I'm going to show it in 1975, and it was responsible for studying the whole new series of particles, charm particles, beam mesons, and so forth. So that's basically why we use colliding beams, and I'm going to talk about colliding beam machines. This is a picture to show you what happens in an old laboratory. This is now the biggest and most successful laboratory in the world. There's a CERN laboratory in Geneva, Switzerland. And this is all the rings they have. They often talk to each other, and there's dates next to them. So you can see going back, some of the rings go back to 1950s. This is the proton, original proton synchrotron, and they're all over the place. And the laboratory, when you go there, is kind of a, not by design, but by evolution, has built large rings, where this biggest one up here is the Large Hadron Collider, where there's two detectors. Uh, one of them shown here, one of them shown there for doing uh, uh, high energy physics. And these are the two that study the Higgs boson. And a third detector and fourth detector that actually are used in a specialized way to study B mesons or heavy ions. OK, so this is kind of the features that we have to deal with if we have a collider like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Uh, 
In order to study the physics we want to, we need high energy. It goes up to 7 TeV. That's 7, 10 to the 12th EV. Uh, it has a large number of particles in each bunch. Remember, I showed you that we bunch them together. 10 to the 11th particles, an enormous number. And we want to reach a luminosity. Luminosity is this units here, so that if you multiply the luminosity times time, uh, you can calculate the number of collisions so that we can see the, the physics that we want. It needs a luminosity in this, these units of 10 to the 34. The event rate using that in one of these two detectors that I talked about is huge. It's 10 billion interactions every second. So these experiments have to sort that out somehow. It's a huge number, most not very interesting. A proton scatters off a proton. Mostly what it does is just graze. It does something so we know it's not just going through, but it's not really the physics that we talk about. That's called soft. Basically, it doesn't scatter very hard. It's scattered electromagnetically or some other way. And there's a huge number of those, and they go into any detector that you have. Uh, something like 10 to the ninth of those per second. The interesting ones are the ones that make really hard collisions where there's a lot of energy transmitted from one of the particles to the other. And for example, the Higgs boson happens very rarely, and it accounts for about one in 10 trillion of those collisions. So that has to be sorted out in the detectors. And so one of the reasons we talk more about the detectors, and the detectors are so challenging, and the science is so challenging, you don't really hear as much about the accelerator that enabled it, is this is a huge job to be able to pick this out. This is just a picture of the CERN machine with some of the parameters. It's 17 miles uh, circumference. It's steep underground, which protects you from the uh, radiation. It's 300 feet underground. It has, uh, uh, it's superconducting, meaning that it runs uh, at low temperature where you can get higher fields. And uh, it uh, has a huge amount of stored energy in it, something like 10,000 megajoules of stored energy. And there's this huge number of collisions, which I talked about. And it runs at 14 trillion electron volts. Just as a comparison, just to think about it, uh, a proton beam that stores 700 megajoules is about equivalent to the energy in a 747 uh, taking off or an, enough energy to melt about a half a ton of copper. So there's a huge amount of stored energy, which we have to worry about if we ever have to dump it uh, in the machine because it's circulating the machine. Most of it not interacting and not giving us particle physics. Okay, so we, as I mentioned, we developed these particle accelerators that can be colliders in the 1970s. And the one that I'm going to concentrate on is the electron-positron one, not the proton one. I'll explain to you why. And we've had three generations of those, and I want to point out why just historically first we're interested in a fourth generation. The first generation was the Spear uh, Collider at uh, Stanford, at SLAC. And that was quite successful, as I'll show you. And the second generation was in Germany at uh, the DESI laboratory called uh, PETRA. The third generation was at CERN called LEP. And we're talking about the fourth generation now and whether it'll happen. So that's the one I'm going to concentrate on. But let me talk, tell you a little bit about the first three. And to do that, let's talk a little bit about the difference between proton-proton and electron-positron collisions and why electron-positron collisions are so valuable even though they're so much harder to do. It's harder to make a machine, to, and I'll explain why, that uh, accelerates electrons to high energy and makes enough collisions compared to a proton machine. Protons are complicated. They're made out of quarks, like the little in indications here, or what we call gluons, what holds it all together uh, under quantum chromodynamics. So we basically have a complicated object hitting a complicated object, and the actual hard scattering that we're going to look at involves one of the objects, one of the constituents in one of the protons hitting a constituent in the other proton. Uh, but you don't know which one it is. So it could be a, one of the quarks. You don't know which one. It can be a gluon. You don't know which, which weather. And you don't know exactly how much momentum this one happens to be carrying of the proton. The proton's momentum is carried 
somehow in this combination. And so when you have the scattering, you don't know very much about the initial state. Then you have a, a lot of things that happen, and you and look at the final state. If instead we go to the second one, which is electrons and positrons, the initial conditions are totally well defined. We know an electron is a very simple particle. We have one of different charge, but we know its features. We know when it uh, comes together, it annihilates all the energy, which isn't true here. All the energy goes into the final products. And it doesn't have all this so-called soft scattering. So essentially everything is useful in making high energy collisions because it just annihilated. And uh, it th therefore produces what I call particles democratically, which means it doesn't favor some particular physics over some other physics, which enables you, as I'll show you, to produce things like Higgs bosons uh, with a, in a much larger fraction of the data. And lastly, if you are good enough, on the single event, you can reconstruct everything here. You couldn't possibly do that here because you don't know what the incoming uh, conditions were. But here, where I know exactly the direction, the spins, and the energy of the incoming system, if I was good enough and could make a detector that was good enough, I could study in absolute detail what comes out. In practice, we can't quite do that. Some of the particles that come out, for example, neutrinos, we can't measure. Uh, we can't always see neutrons. Uh, and photons, the invisible particles, and sometimes we can't separate them if they're too close together. So we can't make a perfect detector yet, or at this time, but we can do a lot better than here. So we're somewhere in between looking for a needle in a haystack here where we have mostly background and being able to see the events here. So let's uh, look at the history a little bit. The, the, the development of electron-positron colliders like most things, the first idea actually was in the Soviet Union and was published, but not a, a, an, as a concept. But the first development was actually in Italy. And it was this man here, Bruno Tuschek, who built the first successful electron-positron collider. This is the first one, called Eta. And then he built several other generations. He eventually managed to get up to a center of mass energy of 3 GeV. And you've never heard of this guy. He's the hero in the field. Uh, and it's almost an accident, because at 3.1 GeV, uh, the world changed. And that was the discovery of ch charm particles, the psi particle, and so forth. And that was done a generation later at SLAC, but only a few percent more energy, uh, which produced this particle where the topology look looked like this, and it was given the name psi. It also provided the discovery of all the charm particles and changed particle physics. The second generation, which was at DESI, uh, was important for another discovery. It managed to discover what we call our gluons in the lab, uh, but it was really the laboratory proof of an important concept in strong interactions in particle physics, which is quantum chromodynamics. So the proof of quantum chromodynamics came from this experiment seeing uh, features of gluons at the DESI machine. And these three gentlemen won the Nobel, the theorists won the Nobel Prize for the quantum chromodynamics, which this confirmed. And the last generation that we've had, which is at CERN, is the LEP Collider. And it, it has been responsible for two, one thing mainly, which is confirmation in great detail of this, what's called the standard model of particle physics. Uh, that's called a model, not a theory. So the, the whole problem that we have is how do we get past the word model? But it has many, many measurements, all of which agree within statistical limits, within a couple sigma, of the predictions for different channels and so forth of the standard model. Uh, it uh, also searched for the Higgs boson but a little bit like Mr. Tushek, it went up to here, the yellow part, this, this part, and went up to about 110 GeV before it was limited by radio frequency power in the machine. And the Higgs boson sits at 125. So this could have been discovered a decade before in a clean way on this machine if it had gone 10% higher in, in energy. Uh, but the potential, as you can imagine, is here, because I'll show you what the E plus E minus machine can do. So that's the background. 
We can have particle colliders then that look like this, a set of magnets to make particles go around in the circle. Uh, they come together at some point, and uh, if they collide, we detect them in our detectors. Uh, and in the meantime, if they don't collide, it goes around again, and they try to collide on the second time. What I'm going to talk about today is what's called a linear collider. This is a schematic picture of the linear collider that I'll describe. And it has a different set of problems, but first I have to tell you why it's a linear collider. So we have circular colliders, and we want to go to, be, to understand why we need a, a, a linear collider. It's a new technology. It's very challenging. I'm going to go through it in some detail. But first, let me try to show you why we need it. The problem is that on a circular machine, electrons are very light. And if we send electrons and we, we, we accelerate them around a radius to keep them in, this, in, in a ring so we can have counter-rotating rings, they radiate. They radiate by what we call synchrotron radiation. Uh, and that depends on the mass of the particle and the energy of the particle. Protons, which are 2,000 times heavier than an electron, basically also synchrotron radiate, but not very much. So this is a problem for electrons. That's why we don't talk about linear colliders. For protons, we only have to talk about it for electrons. This is the formula for the energy loss in this radiation. So the loss of energy goes as the fourth power of the energy. So when we want to increase the energy of an accelerator, we rapidly run into this problem. And inversely is the fourth power of the mass, which is why the proton is not such a problem, but the electron, which is 2,000 times lighter, is. And the cost, then, is some combination of the radius, or the circumference, and the amount of energy you lose that you have to pump back in. If I minimize that, I can then optimize, and the radius for a machine, in an electron machine, you can calculate, goes as the energy squared. And therefore, the cost goes as the energy squared. So we have a picture that looks like this, a circular collider. As we go up in energy, the cost will go up in energy, optimizing it for how big you have to make it. And we know the cost of these machines get very expensive. When we change without not solving the problem of how to make a linear collider yet, eventually a linear collider will grow linearly with cost, approximately. And so eventually these have to cross each other. If I take these costs together and try to do a realistic estimate, that crossover is at about 200 GeV, which is the energy that you saw LEP go to. So LEP was more or less the highest energy that you can go to in a circular machine in a reasonable way. You can make a bigger one, but basically that's the optimization. So going to a TV, which is where we want to go, uh, requires a different technology. And that's what drives us to a, to a linear machine. So this is the picture of the linear machine, which I'm going to deconstruct for you and show you the different and important parts of that uh, machine. Uh, it's drawn out of scale, but there's different elements that are here. These are the long linax, so this acts like two rifles pointing at each other. And, but we need to do a lot to make those rifles have the kind of beam that will actually hit each other and we'll have the characteristics that we want. And I'll describe that to you. But that's the scale is that the total length of the machine that's being uh, compared and being proposed and being uh, evaluated in Japan right now is 30 kilometers long in its initial version. And it's upgradable to twice that, which is about 50 kilometers long. So it's, the program is to make a 30 kilometer long machine that could be extrapolated to be extended to one TV, or, um, and this is one TV, which is to be compared with 14 TV in the proton machine, the LHC. But as you saw in the pictures earlier, that a 14 GV LHC mostly has only one constituent carrying part of that energy in one uh, in one uh, direction scattering against one of the constituents in the other direction. And the typical center of mass energy for the constituents is more like this energy. So they're comparable to each other. This is a picture, a uh, schematic picture of the machine at CERN. It's 27 kilometers long. It's about 100 meters underground. 
and it has four experimental stations, and it goes in a big circle. Likewise, the linear collider is planned to be about 100 meters underground, and it's just a different geometry. It's about, 30, about as much length, but it's 30 kilometers long linearly, and it follows the curvature of the Earth. In contrast to LIGO, which you'll hear about next, which has to be laser straight. This follows the curvature of the Earth, I'll tell you now so I won't forget later, for two reasons. One is that uh, if you go deep underground, you want to make a geology that's stable to put this big tunnel in. And the layers of the Earth tend to be in, in strips. And so to stay for 30 or 50 kilometers in good geology, you want to follow the curvature of the Earth. That's a practical reason. The second one's practical also. The, the machine itself is cryogenic. It has a big cryogenic plant to cool down the uh, system. These are, uh, as I'll show you, are RF cavities that are cryogenic, uh, run at low temperature. And so you have cryogenics that are on the Earth's surface and uh, cool the, 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 the device. And if you have a, a laser straight device, then it's not going to be perpendicular to the Earth everywhere. And so the cryogenics and fluid are going to want to flow one direction or another. If we follow the curvature of the Earth, then in any place locally, the cryogenics stays. So we follow the curvature of the Earth. And in contrast to LIGO, which is a light beam, we can make little corrections and, and do that without affecting the optics very much. So that's just a decision that's made. This is just a picture schematically. I'm not going to describe it, just to show you the scale. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider is made out of 15 meter long uh, uh, cooled uh, magnets. And they look like this, and they're 15 meters long. To the naked eye, the Linear Collider looks almost the same. It's 15 meter long, roughly. Uh, units, about the same diameter. The guts are completely different. In this case, we have cavities and not magnets, and, uh, and cooling and so forth is done in a, in a totally different way. But for a practical matter of putting together an accelerator, it looks pretty much the same. We have units that are about 15 uh, meters long that are tied together uh, cryogenically and electronically. So let me compare the features again. Uh, I've said many of these. So we're going to have uh, in the ILC, electron-positron collisions versus proton-proton collisions. The center of mass energy is a half to one TeV versus 14 TeV, but we don't get to use for most collisions much of this 14 TeV. The luminosity is more in the ILC than in the LHC because we're trying to do very precise physics and need the statistics. The accelerator type is linear compared to circular, so this kind of summarizes what I've said. And it's superconducting RF versus superconducting magnets. So they're both cryogenic, but different. OK, now let me start showing you why it complements what's done at the LHC and why we want it. First, I'm showing a non-complementary picture of the Higgs discovery. And it's not the most recent one. So, uh, but basically, this is on a linear scale. Usually when you see it, there's a suppressed zero. And the data is shown here. And the line through it is a simulation of what the, all the reactions are in particle physics as well as they're known. And the little bump here, which is shown blown up down here, is the Higgs boson without the best statistics that they've accumulated now. The point I want to make here is that the size of this bump compared to the background is something like 1 in 10 or 1 in 20. So the uh, events that we have in the Higgs are only 5 or 10% of the events that we take in that, in that mass spin. Therefore, if we want to study the features of the Higgs, there's an enormous background. And that's the next step. And I'm going to talk about those features a little bit. OK, this pictorially shows you the difference. This is a, a collision. In the LHC, this is the detector schematically, and all the lines are the different particles emanating. And that's because so many things happen. While in the LHC, as I said, it's much simpler. These are basically two uh, jets of particles that are the products of the Higgs making a, a B particle and an anti-B particle. 
and you can see that the topology is much simpler, and the signal to background, which I'll show you next, is also very, very different. So this is a simulation, of course, not the data, but this is the uh, energy of about 120 GeV, uh, the simulation for what the Higgs would look like, put on top of the background, and so you can see at the peak, this is somewhere near 300 compared to a background of about 100. So there's, the signal is two to one instead of one to 10. And so if we take a band and try to analyze the features, it's a totally different, uh, a different game. So what do you want to do? We want to, of course, accurately measure the mass of the Higgs, the branching ratios, the width, the spin, the coupling, and so forth. Let me say why. The Higgs is really different. It's the, we have a lot of particles in particle physics, but the Higgs is the particle that reflects on the, the theoretical description of why particles have mass. So it's, it makes the field massive. That means it behaves totally differently and has to have particular features. First, it has to be a zero spin particle. Secondly, it couples to mass because it's responsible for mass. Other particles don't couple to mass, they couple to strong interaction or weak interaction or, or electromagnetic interaction, but not to mass. So this is unique. That it, uh, and uh, the masses and the decay rates are related to this. And this is just pictorially how it couples to mass. And therefore, uh, its features can be tested if you have a clean environment. The first one is, is the spin zero? So we want to now understand, we've seen this Higgs, we believe it's the Higgs, but we want to now understand what its characteristics are and whether or not it's a simple model of the Higgs or something different from that. So first is to measure the quantum number, show that it's spin zero. This turns out to be trivial to do on an electron positron machine and very, very difficult, except by inference, on a hadron machine. Why? Because all the energy goes into the collision. So we can go to threshold, which I picked a graph which doesn't have the right mask, but it's close. And it, depending on how the reaction behaves off of threshold depends on the spin of the state. So if the spin is zero, just like in quantum mechanics, you can calculate the behavior. If the spin were one, it would go up like this. If the spin were two, like this. So to prove that it's spin one, we should see a behavior near threshold that has this kind of behavior. So that's the simplest thing, is to show that it's spin zero. The second is the dramatic issue that the uh, coupling should depend on mass. The way to test that is to look at the coupling to the different uh, particles or quarks, the charm quark, the tau, the B quark, the W, the Z, the Higgs, the top. So the, the, this should be a linear line on a log-log scale if it depends on mass. This would be flat if it was another particle. So this is completely different behavior. So it's linear, but that's only the first step. The second is how close to linear should it be? If it's the very, very simplest model of the Higgs, it'll be linear like this. But it isn't the only model in town of what the Higgs might be like. I just picked one case over here. So if it's simple, it would fit that straight line as we went through the different particles. If it's a different model, I use the minimum supersymmetric model here just as an example, then within 10 or 20%, it'll be that same linear line, but it'll have such significant differences depending on, on that particular model. So the next thing is to qualitative, quantitatively measure this behavior that I showed uh, here and ask whether it's truly linear, good enough statistics to do that, and that's why I show the band here, or it has a shape that's somewhat different than that, which will tell us whether or not the model is, that the physics is somewhat different than the simplest picture of the Higgs. Okay. And I'm just for another example of a comparison, in the same energy range, you can produce our heaviest quark, the top quark. So if you take, all I've shown here is the couplings of the top quark and how well you can determine them at the LHC versus the red part, the ILC. So about 10 times better, even though you have this uh, weaker machine. Supersymmetry, it's the biggest question we still have in particle physics. So far at the LHC, there's been many searches for supersymmetry. Uh, 
uh, no evidence for it, which is disappointing, but it doesn't rule it out at all because supersymmetry has a variety of possible parameters, some of which could be, see, could be visible and some of which wouldn't be visible so far at the LHC. And the biggest uh, goal of the coming run at the LHC, the run that they're on now, is to pursue more whether they see supersymmetry. It may not be there, or it may be there. Let me say what it is. So we have the different constituents of nature, the spin half ones, which are the fundamental quarks and leptons, and the carriers of the forces, the photon, the gluon, the W and the Z, and their spin one. And now we have an addition. We have the Higgs particle. That's the particles we have, basically, that describe particle physics. First question is, is there only just one Higgs? Or are there several? We don't know. And different, there's different reasons to think there might be more. So we haven't seen it, but we don't know yet. There, there may be a partners of the 125 GeV Higgs that are higher energy. So that's the first question to answer. Of course, I showed the one already that it's been zero. The idea of supersymmetry is that there's a mirror set of particles that basically uh, are these, they're called the same names, uh, the neutrino becomes, the Higgs becomes the Higgsino and so forth, and those are the partners. Basically what we've done is to make a new symmetry, a pro, uh, what we've proposed is a new symmetry in nature that symmetrizes bosons and fermions. And that's what supersymmetry is. The reason it's attractive is first the qualitative thing that symmetries have always brought so much in particle physics, but three reasons. One is that temptingly close, if we project an energy, we work down here, 100 GeV was LEP, and we measure things that are electromagnetic, we measure things that are uh, weak, decays of particles, and things that are strong. If we take all the data down here and project it into much higher energy, they temptingly come close to together at about 10 to the 14th or 10 to the 15th GeV, but they don't come together. If you actually look at the accuracy of these lines, they don't intersect. If you were to introduce supersymmetry, these basically intersect. So the, so the idea that excluding gravity, the three main forces that we study come together at super high energies, and we're looking at the split of those at very low energies, is a very tempting idea, the unification, and would be basically true if we found supersymmetry, or could be, could be true. The second is that it solves a uh, uh, theoretical problem, what we call the hierarchy problem, which has to do with the range of, of energies that we have, and how to explain that, or masses that we have. And the third one, is that supersymmetry could be the dark matter. If it's the dark matter, then it's both important for particle physics and obviously for astronomy and astrophysics, so it's a, a very tempting, wonderful solution. The combination of these, depending on whether you're a, a real theorist who likes the hierarchy problem or you like the unification of forces or the combination of all these, makes it the most popular idea in physics, but we have no evidence that it's true. Okay, we take the, we've taken then about a decade ago all the parameters from doing studies of how we could pursue those different uh, topics and uh, brought together a study that w went for several months and a set of parameters came out of that driven from the physics to use to then drive the parameters of a, of a machine. This is an important thing experimentally. You like to not drive the parameters of an instrument you make from the instrumental things, but from the science you want to do. So starting from the science and knowing what you need to accomplish it, you want to design a machine that'll meet that. So the parameters that came out of this study are listed here. I'll just say a couple words about them, then I'll start showing you the machine. So the parameters that came out is the machine should be adjustable in energy, that's obvious. Uh, because you want to trace the rise and fall of any one of these things. The total luminosity is to get enough statistics, and so that's set what the luminosity number had to be. You need to be able to adjust the energies. That is an added feature to be able to change the energies and not just make it at one energy. And the parameters for how stable it should be. And a last one is the value that you actually, and it takes some work, make the particles polarized. 
And this machine should be done in a way that you can upgrade the energy or double the energy eventually. So those are the parameters. We've used those parameters then, starting in 2005 or 2006, to make a, a, technical, a conceptual and then technical design of the machine. So I use this picture to show the, the features of the, of the machine that you have to worry about to make a linear collider telling you before what the features are. Uh, the main part is this long thing that's, that's 30 or 50 kilometers, and that's the LINAC, and it's the most expensive. But from a particle accelerator point of view, all these other features, which I'll talk briefly about, are crucial to being able to make the thing. So money-wise and technology-wise, you have to make these long LINACs, but we have to be able to make electrons and positrons make the optics such that we can focus them down to a very small spot and so forth. So I'm gonna focus on all these other elements quite a lot. I'll let, I'm gonna briefly then take you through the machine. The guts of it and the heart of it is a superconducting RF main LINAC. These are superconducting cavities, one meter long, nine cells, and uh, made out of niobium. And uh, they uh, basically look like this, but there's a lot, we have to make a lot of them. So we have to learn how to make them in an industrial way. There's a total in the machine of 16,000 of these cavities that we have to make in a way that are reliable and cheap. So we have to learn how to, how to, have to, learn how to design it so they can be made reliable and cheap. And they have to have high gradient, which I'll come to. They, they're put inside a module that looks like the magnets at CERN, but they're what we call cryo module, so you can cool them. There's 2,000 of those. And then we need to be able to focus the beam and so forth, so there's other elements. These are not obvious how to make these, these uh, how to shape these cells. So I've shown here three different shapes for these cells. And basically, the gradient that you can get to to accelerate particles depends on that evolution. This is the natural shape that was done in 1992. And by the time we designed it, we had two alternate shapes we were looking at. You'll notice these shapes are, are flatter in shape. That makes more surface area for the same distance than you have here. And the larger surface area spreads out the magnetic field compared to the electric gra uh, gradient. And it's the breakdown of the surface that limits you. So this gives you a somewhat higher field. What our goal has been is to have a machine that runs at 35 megavolts per, that cavities can run at 35 million volts, megavolts per meter to get to establish the length of the machine we have and, and so forth. And we've made a lot of cavities that easily reach that, but in an industrial case, it's harder, of course. Uh, and, but we have a good uh, test facility. There's basically a smaller machine being completed at DESI for a different purpose. It's a, an XFEL, uh, 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 free electron laser of 17 GeV and has about five or 7% as many cavities or cryomodules as we do, being made in industry and having a requirement that's very similar. And in fact, they used our technological development to make this machine. They're getting a machine and we're getting uh, an existence proof of exactly how to do it all in industry. So that's been done. This is just, I'm not gonna go through these. This is just to show you all the different elements besides the cavity and putting it into a cryo module where you cool it down. Uh, we have to get the, uh, we have to couple one cavity to the next. We have to be able to put RF in and so forth and so on. So they're rather complicated inside. This is the picture, simplest picture I can draw of the luminosity and how we achieve it. Uh, if you look at the left, that's the circular machine. It has a luminosity of the, the highest one I showed you has a luminosity of 5, 10 to the 31. And it's done by having uh, a fast rep rate and uh, a certain number of, of uh, 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 particles per bunch. And this is the number of bunches. The parameters for the ILC are different, but we make up for the uh, ones that are low, like this one, the frequency, uh, by having a large number of bunches and uh, 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 number of particles per bunch, and we I mean, small sizes in the end, which I'm gonna to come to, and that allows you using this formula to get the luminosity of 10 to the 34. 
So there's some existence of other ones in extrapolation, none of which the extrapolations are so long that we shouldn't be able to achieve this. There's no new problems or anything that we expect. So that achieving that luminosity looks to us doable. Uh, but we have to do it in a way that has the biggest challenge of the optics to somehow make sure that we can have enough collisions that these particles don't just go around each other. And that's done by what we call making a very low emittance optics. What does that mean? Emittance is an accelerator physicist term for what I would call low transverse momentum. We have to get rid of all the transverse momentum so the particles are going parallel, a parallel beam into a lens. You can focus down to a point. So we have to make basically uh, uh, get rid of the transverse momentum. And then once we get rid of it, we have to make sure it doesn't grow by all the nonlinearities in this long system that we have. And finally, we have to be able to squeeze the beam. So what's the requirement? And this requirement is probably the toughest uh, technical thing, purely technical thing. And that is we have to get the beam in one direction down to five nanometers, which is much, much smaller than any previous machine. And the other direction is longer, so it's a ribbon. But, uh, and so we need good enough optics, parallel beam, to be able to focus it down to approximately five nanometers. And then the two beams have a, enough probability to give the luminosity that I indicated in the collisions themselves. So because this is the hardest, we build a rather elaborate test setup to make sure we don't run into some fundamental physics problem before we get to this small level. We build it at uh, KEK Laboratory in, in Japan. And the history of how small a beam spot size we could get is shown here. The optics is not the same as for the uh, linear collider, so we have to extrapolate from this, but we know how to do that. So this is the progress. And just as we were needed the whole thing uh, in order to convince the technical critics and the governments that, we, that this machine was feasible, we had a huge earthquake in Japan. And that set us back a little bit. Uh, but it's gone on since then, and we're now down to 44 nanometers. 44 nanometers is to be compared with our goal, which was 37 nanometers, very close. And 37 nanometers for this configuration will give six nanometers in the ILC, which has longer, you know, longer features where we can tell. And that change from this to this has no error, and it's just geometry. OK, so these are the different elements then that have to come together in the linear collider. And I'm going to talk about them very quickly, one by one. Uh, first, physically, the, the business end, the machine, is in one tunnel. And all the klystrons and all the um, power supplies and everything in a separate tunnel. So there's two tunnels in contrast to CERN. Uh, the Japanese have actually changed the design to one tunnel with a barrier in between. The idea is that you should be able to come into this and work on the klystrons, replace them, or all the technical elements while the machine's running. That can't be done at CERN, but this machine's more complicated. So we want to make sure that we don't lose a lot of time by people not being able to get access to fix things. So it's a double tunnel. This, everything is done from the center. So there's kind of a central campus in this idea where all the business end is in the center, but then we send the beam all the way out and accelerate it on both ends, one end being electron, one end positrons. So all the things I'll talk about could be in a laboratory that's uh, a few kilometers by a few kilometers. And that includes the electron source, the positron source, the delivery system for the beam itself, which has to make these very small spot sizes, the interaction region where the detectors go, what I call damping rings, which I'll tell you what they are in a second. And all of this is together. Rather complicated because they're all together in the same area, but it means that you have a central laboratory where you can work. Uh, this is the damping ring. I'm not going to go through the details of the damping ring, but I'm going to tell you what it's for. We have to get rid of the transverse components of the beam. The way you do that is to have these elements that are shown here called wigglers. And the wiggler basically wiggles the, the, the electrons. They radiate photons. In that process, they radiate away the preferentially the energy that is transverse. So the way we dampen the transverse components is to have this so-called damping ring. 
So that's the trick there. The ring itself is very similar to third generation light sources. Uh, we have these extra wigglers to get rid of the, they use wigglers effect, uh, effectively that to fo radiate photons for physics, but otherwise the machine is pretty similar to that. It's three stories high. We have the electron ring over the positron ring, and we have two positron rings to have enough particles. Uh, second is to make enough positrons. To make positrons in this machine, uh, electrons are easy. You strip those off of things, but the positrons are basically harder to make. We make those by running electrons up to high energy, then running them into a target where they make photons which convert to make electron-positron pairs, grab the positrons, and accelerate them afterwards. So it's a rather complicated system, which I won't go through here. Uh, and you have to pick the energy such that you capture, you can both capture the positrons afterwards and you produce enough positrons. And that tends to be not so far from the total energy of the machine. So you basically have to bring the electrons up to three quarters, or the whole energy of the machine, then run them into a target. So we do every other bunch, one of the bunches to make positrons, one of the bunches to use as electrons. This is the polarized electron source. This is not so difficult compared to what's done in other accelerators, except we want the electrons to be polarized, which limits the choices of what kind of gun and what kind of scattering we use. I don't have time to really go through that, but we make sure the electrons are, are uh, polarized. The last that I want to show, I think it's the last before the detectors, is a rather long element, which is you come out of these two uh, linux, and now we want to bring the beam down to a very small spot size. So even if we kept all the optics very carefully right, we still have to bend particles, bring them together, and so forth, and we can't spoil this perfectly parallel beam from coming together into this very small beam spot size. That turns out to be a rather long and tedious process to do it in a way that comes down to uh, a small beam spot size. And you'll notice that the total length is a few kilometers, because if we bend the particles too much, uh, they radiate. So it, it's very soft, so they don't radiate. And then we have all kinds of ways of getting rid of background particles, that's these collimators, and to bring them into a final focus. This is the, schematically then what happens. It comes in then on one side as positrons, on the other side as electrons, and then we have a surrounding detector which has two main features. One is that it tracks every outgoing charged particle and its momentum in a big magnet. And the second is it identifies particles from each other. It identifies particles from each other in different kinds of calorimeters, and it basically tracks them in very accurate tracking usually silicon uh, strip uh, trackers. And this is typical of the experiments that are already done at CERN, but with more emphasis on better resolution in, in this case. There's a tradition in particle physics to have two detectors to be able to check anything you have and have different systematics. So there's two CERN detectors. In our case, it's too expensive to build two different areas so instead, we have what's called a push-pull system. So in series, one detector can roll onto the beam, the other one off the beam, and you run for some time with one and some time with the other. Uh, the resolution that we need, and I just want to give you the feeling for this, is considerably better than what's achieved in the LHC detectors. This is the pixel size, how much smaller, roughly a factor of 10, 30 in some cases, that the material has to be less, so we don't scatter and lose particles or convert them, and that we do better calorimetry than what's traditionally done in particle physics. All of those have been worked on very intensively in R&D program, not by accelerator physicists, but particle physicists. And just as an example, this is a production of the Higgs particle and what it would look like, here it is, what it would look like with better resolution compared to the present kind of resolution that you get on the LHC, so that's the motivation. And pictorially, we want to be able to separate particles, which now are not separated in the LHC, this is LHC type resolution, into separate jets. And those, again, in test beams have been developed. OK, this is the site that has been chosen by the Japanese physicists, geologists, and government to put this machine. It's in Japan, about uh, four hours north of Tokyo, 
uh, in, in an area called Kitakami. It's in the, what they call the mountains, but it's not really mountains, it's foothills. Uh, they go enough into the mountains for this proposed site so that the underlying geology is granite, which the Japanese like, because granite's very, very stable, and they've developed the technology to tunnel in granite despite its hardness. And so the tunnel is granite, and it basically then doesn't have to be stabilized. It's 50 kilometers long at the site. You can see you can't go further here. You'd be at the sea. Uh, it's 300 meters above sea level, but it's 100 meters below the ground. So it's not going to be hurt by a, a, a disaster like happened before in Japan. And being underground, there's very little shaking, so it's very stable. Uh, I just want to spend the last three minutes that I have on what uh, other machines are being talked about. The Chinese are actually talking about building the next generation proton machine, bigger than the LHC, and something like 75 kilometers around. This is a picture of it. It's just a big machine. If they built this machine, they could start by using, because it's bigger, by using E plus E minus in the machine and have high enough energy, which they didn't have at lab, to study the Higgs. So if the Japanese machine isn't built, they could use it for that and then convert it to a high energy proton machine. This is in its very early stages of design. Uh, they haven't yet solved the problem that if you have one turn where you bring the particles together and they disrupt each other, and when it comes around again, they're useful and can be focused again. But it, that's probably solvable. So it's in, a, it's in a design phase. And lastly, I just want to mention before I stop, is this the end of particle physics, what I've shown you, the ability to make these accelerators? I think probably not, but let me just tell you why. Uh, we don't know for sure. But making accelerators like we're talking about, we're near the last generation, either the ILC or maybe a machine like I just talked about. Are there other techniques where we might be able to go to higher energies and make machines that could go to higher energy? If you think about the problem, what limits us in the present generation of machines and all machines we've had is materials. In the case of uh, magnets, the field that we can get in the magnets is limited by the, f by the materials they're made out of. If we talk about cavities, we may do better than niobium, but not much. We're limited by when the surface breaks down and how much we can put on it. So is there a way to get rid of materials? That's really the goal, the need, if you were to go to another generation someday. And there is a scheme, and it may work, but it's very early. And that is to use, eliminate ma materials and use a plasma that you excite and run particles into the plasma in the way that we've talked about. So our machine looks like this, and you can make a plasma cavity that looks like this, put a plasma in and excite the plasma with either a beam of particles or with lasers. And uh, what's been done and demonstrated is promising. This they managed at SLAC to make a small one meter long cavity that took a machine that's two miles long and accelerates particles up to 40 GeV, and in one meter they doubled the energy, but only for a few particles. So this is the 40 GeV and a few of them getting up to as high as 80. But the fact they can double it, of course to make a viable machine you have to bring them all up or most of them up and not, not but they have been able to get huge accelerations in a very short distance with plasmas where you're not limited by the, by the materials. The second is can you take plasma beams and focus them at all? And there's been work most recently in Berkeley where they've managed to, at low energies, focus beams uh, made in a plasma to let less than one degree, which is not as small as we do for high energy accelerators, but is reasonable and reduce the energy spread to a few percent so you don't have this long tail that I showed. And so that's promising as well. The uh, work that's going on now is to do it on a bigger scale and to try to do this. I would say it's tens of years away, maybe 50 or 40 or 30 or something. But my conclusion is that there could be, if, if the physics demands it, uh, the ability to go yet to yet higher energy and accelerator. So let me summarize and then I'm done. Uh, the International Linear Collider is being considered in Japan. It's got very strong science motivation, which I showed you. The, the technology is very mature. It's been well reviewed everywhere. And the question is whether the Japanese government and the physics community really wants to take it on. If it's finished, it would be like 2025. 
There's a couple alternatives that I didn't talk about, other options. There's a way to make uh, an accelerator like the linear collider, but not with superconducting uh, uh, technology, but instead by a different technology, which I won't describe. Uh, it is a very, because it's not superconducting, it's very power uh, uh, hungry. And so power consumption becomes a big issue if we're going to do that. Uh, another idea is to start with muons and make a muon collider, which is the same physics as an electron collider. That's a very intriguing idea, but has an enormous number of issues to actually make pi mesons and make muons, capture them, and actually focus them into this kind of beam. And then I mentioned the Chinese large machine. And the final thing is the possibility of either laser-driven or beam-driven plasma wake field accelerators. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you.